Hello and uh, good morning. Welcome to this round table on corporate citizenship. My name is Nico Heller and this is Reboot 2030, the Democracy Sports YouTube channel and podcast. Existing law provides that directors must act in the best interest of the corporation, must act in the best interest of the corporation. Bob Hinckley, a renowned American attorney and one of the democracy school's regular dialogue partners, poses a code for corporate citizenship that would add, but not at the expense of severe damage to the environment, human rights, public health and safety, dignity of employees, or welfare of the communities within which the corporation operates. Bob believes, if adopted, this simple addition to corporate law would fundamentally transform the way corporations operate and do business. In this reboot special, our discussions place Bob's proposed code under the microscope within a European environmental and climate change context and discuss it from both a legal and an investment or economic point of view. So let me invite our four discussants in. Right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Nice to meet Hello. you. Good to see you all. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Bob, too. Coming to us <laughs> from to Australia, here, halfway around the world. Good to see you, Bob. Good to be now, here, mate. Let me, let me very briefly introduce you to our, our viewers. With me today are Robert Higley. He is a, a renowned um, corporate attorney and author of Time to Change Corporations, Closing the Citizenship Gap. With us also is not yet but hopefully very soon, Francesca Luigi, a PhD candidate in law and economics uh, at Bologna and Rotterdam universities and a specialist in environmental liability and damages at the international and the EU level. Also with us is Susanna Cafaro, a renowned professor of EU law and the Schaumann chair at the University of Salento in Italy. Thank you very much, Susanna, for making time. It's great to have you with us again today. And finally, there's young, you. uh, young Yin, Koi, he's Director of Impact and ESG at Vidya Equity Game Behind Munich. And Yang Yin has asked me to say that he's participating in a personal capacity in this, uh, in, in this round table. Welcome, Yang Yin. Hi, Nico. Now, the catalyst for this round table was an article about Danone or Danon, as it's known in the US, a consumer packaged goods giant and one of the world's worst plastic polluters who is being sued by environmental groups in France for insufficiently reducing its plastic footprint. Under a French, uh, uh, under a French law passed in 2017 called the duty of vigilance, companies are compelled to identify and prevent environmental damage and human rights violations. Now we felt that this was a step in the right direction. However, Bob, and Bob, thank you very much for kind of um, making yourself available here today, Bob maintained that his code, his code for corporate citizenship, would be much less intrusive, much easier to implement, more effective at stopping corporations from causing severe damage. So let's have a look at these two approaches, the code for corporate citizenship as proposed by Bob Hinckley and France Studio of Vigilance. Bob, over to you. Maybe you could start by telling us about the background, the substance and expected impact of your proposed code for corporate citizenship. Sure. Thank you very much, Nico. It's good to be with you this evening or this morning in Europe. Uh, almost 25 years ago, I was having lunch with a friend who was a professor of social policy at Sydney University. He was interested in getting Australian companies to pay more attention to human rights in the workplace when it came to their Asian subsidiaries. He asked me, why is it that when I talk to Australian CEOs, they don't seem to care about human rights? It's not like they're against the idea. It just doesn't seem to matter to them. And like any corporate lawyer would, I knew the answer to that question. I replied, they don't see it as part of their job description, Stuart. They see their job as simply making money for shareholders. To the extent human rights is a factor for them, it's that they know their company must comply with laws which protect human rights, 
But it's the company's lawyers who oversee that responsibility, not the CEOs. Compliance with business regulation is the job of subordinates. When lots of money is at stake and there's no law prohibiting a destructive corporate behavior, making money will always take precedence over reducing or eliminating the damage. This is why ESG and socially responsible investing have not been able to stop corporate behavior that is severely destructive. For example, the emission of greenhouse gases. The professor's problem was that protecting human rights wasn't on the CEO's radar. Weak human rights laws in Asia weren't a problem for them to consider. It might even been one of the original reasons for them setting up in Asia in the first place. I started thinking about a solution. W. Edwards Deming, the American management consultant who taught Japanese manufacturing quality control in the last half of the 20th century, ran into a similar problem. He recognized that putting inspectors at the end of production lines wouldn't result in the production of high quality products. All it would do is create what he called a systems problem, a current conflict of corporate goals. The board of directors and CEO wanted to make money. The object of the quality control department was to improve product quality. Deming realized that eventually the cost of quality control would be too much for the board and the CEO to bear. They would either put pressure on inspectors to allow more defective products to go through or cut out the inspections altogether. He reckoned that for quality to become a reality, there had to be a change to eliminate the systems problem. The board of directors had to fully commit to the company producing high quality products. This had to be more than uh, per, uh, paying just lip service to quality. It had to be genuine because otherwise employees would catch on and let quality standards decline in order to protect what they thought the CEO and the board really wanted, which was more profits. Now, a few decades after Deming, a professor at MIT by the name of Peter Seng, who was the author of the fifth discipline, the art of the learning organization, he said that the best way to correct a systems problem in business is to find the point of highest leverage in the system and make a small change which will yield the most improvement. It was with this in mind that the Code for Corporate Citizenship was designed. The point of highest leverage in the corporation is the duty of directors. It is from this duty that all corporate action flows. If you can change this duty, if you change this duty, you will change corporate behavior and hopefully for the better. Now, existing law all over the world, existing corporate law, that is, obligates directors to act in the best interests of their company. Directors are told that their company can pursue profit in any way they choose, so long as it doesn't otherwise violate law. The problem with this is that it is legal behavior as opposed to illegal behavior that does the most damage to our environment and the other elements of the public interest. I reckoned the public interest would be better protected if the duty to act in the best interest of the company was subject to a superior obligation to protect the public interest from severe harm. The code will add to the duty to act in the company's best interests the following but not at the expense of severe damage to the environment, human rights, the public health and safety, the dignity of employees, or the well-being of the community in which the company operates. That's it, simple. Any child can understand it, concise. It's only 30 words, and it should be non-controversial. No one should be in favor of corporations causing severe harm severe damage to 
to any of these elements of the public interest. While simple and concise, the code is a major change to the design of the corporation. Viewers of this panel might be interested to know that the last major design change to the corporation came in the late 1800s when obligations to protect the public interest were removed from the corporate law and the duty of directors. In hindsight, this was clearly a mistake. The code seeks to correct it. Changing the duty of directors guarantees that the board will not allow the company under any circumstances to continue engaging in behavior that severely damages the public interest. Making the code an additional legal obligation of directors removes the systems problem created by the board's goal of making money and the company continuing to cause severe harm because it is too costly to stop. Giving protection to the public interest in this, uh, giving protection of the public interest superior status in this way is consistent with the fact that corporations only exist because government sponsors their organization and the purpose of government is to protect the public interest, not destroy it. Now, what should, will, should, will be the impact of these 30 words once they are enacted? The code will make it illegal for directors to allow their company to engage in behavior which they know is causing severe damage, regardless of whether or not that behavior is otherwise legal. The consequences of the code will include one, for the first time in nearly a century and a half, companies will be responsible from the day they are organized for not causing severe harm to the public interest. Two, the conflict which now exists between the goal of government to protect the public interest and the willingness of corporations to continue making money at the cost of its severe harm will be eliminated. Three, the emission of greenhouse gases by big emitters can cease relatively quickly after a brief period of to, to, to allow for a transition to cleaner energy sources. Four, other corporate abuses of the public interest will come under increased scrutiny. Five, directors of all companies will recognize they will no longer be excused or will their behavior be justified when their company continu continues to cause severe harm? Six, further, they will begin to monitor for damage their company is causing to the public interest and take steps to contain or reduce it so as not to eventually run into a problem with the code. Seven, investors will monitor for company compliance. When company behavior becomes under threat from the code, or comes under threat from the code, they will demand the company take action to reduce the threat. If that doesn't work, they'll, it's likely that they will begin withdrawing their capital. Investors will input will encourage company compliance and, social, and socially responsible investing as well as impact investing. Nine, stakeholders, especially employees, will gain greater power to identify and warn companies of potential issues. This will result in greater application of the precautionary principle before vast amounts are invested in property and technologies, which might later be found to cause severe harm. And finally, 10, the code will begin to restore hope for the future. First, by finally doing something meaningful to eliminate the climate emergency we now face. And two, and maybe more importantly, increasing overall public expectations for corporate behavior. Thank you very much. That was a brilliant summary, uh, Bob, of, of, of your thinking and a great starting point for this discussion. Thank you ever so much. Um, it also, for me, throws a lot of light at the perspective from which you come. I mean, you, you're using management thinking, you're using systems thinking, 
And these are perspectives that I think many legal or most legal scholars would probably have a, a blind spot for. Um, and, and maybe that is partially also why so much of legislation doesn't have the operational teeth that it could have. I think your code uh, for corporate citizenship really could sit at the heart of the corporation and become part of its culture. And I think it's a very, very interesting uh, thought. Now, um, let's switch perspective. I couldn't agree uh, with you more, Nico, if I could interrupt here, but I'm not so sure it's the academics that are a problem as, some, as people in state and federal legislatures that oh, they're looking to oh, adopt oh, legislation. I, I do. Agree. I totally agree. I didn't mean to say that <laughs> academics are the problem, but I think if you're sort of steeped in the kind of the company culture in the way you would have been as a corporate attorney uh, over a lifetime, your perspective naturally will be quite different from, say, somebody who's come through a jurisprudential or a sort of a, an academic or indeed a kind of a technocratic career. I think You're that right. was I'm the kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, now, um, switching perspective, I think this will become quite clear. Um, uh, Francesca, Luigi, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I very, very briefly introduced you uh, already. So let's, let's, let's go straight in. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, France's duty for vigilance from, especially from a European legislative uh, perspective? What, what part of my thinking here is, and I think this may well explain some of the uh, the fundamental differences in thinking here, um, has to do with the, if you like, the, sort of the, the legal regimes we're kind of looking at. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say, Bob, that you're coming from a sort of a, a, a common law culture, um, whereas Europe is steeped in civil law, which is much more codified. And as we will see, in, in because of that, more detailed and also more complex. And I think much of the simplicity of your proposal um, is also due to your kind of your common law approach. But uh, let's see how, how this plays out and let's see what Francesca has to say about this. Francesca, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, for this opportunity. I'm very happy to join you today for this very interesting discussion. And yes, so according to our uh, decision, previous decision, so my task is just to introduce the French law from adopted in 2017. And I would like to make a part of, uh, to clarify the linkage between the law and additional experiences uh, regarding the duty of vigilance at the European level, but also uh, with the French law itself. So maybe let me start first from uh, summarizing some the main points of the law. So the law was actually passed in 2017. As we say, this is the corporate duty of vigilance law. It uh, actually mandates comp companies to uh, practice human rights vigilance, due vigilance, uh, due diligence, uh, according to the UN uh, guiding principles on business and human rights. And I want to emphasize this: this law is is closely linked to the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So um, the the goal of the law is to actually uh, include or to introduce the obligation for the companies, large companies, and then I will say a little bit more about the requirements, um, the obligation to identify whether the activity of the company can cause uh, severe damage, severe risk of damage to uh, human rights and environment. And uh, in order to um, make, uh, to oper operationalize these, um, the duty of vigilance, the companies are required to uh, assess and address these risks by drafting vigilance plans. And we need also to clarify what, what are the main requirements of these vigilance plans. And the uh, third important point is that if companies fail to draft the, the vigilance plans according to the law, then interested parties can sue for damages, uh, compensation of damages. So they can require from the companies to um, uh, actually comply with the legislation. And this is a very important point. So uh, citizens, interested parties are part of this picture because they can, uh, they are empowered to do something. Uh, now, let me summarize uh, the scope of the law. As I said, it's, it's just, uh, it is applicable to large companies, 
uh, and with this I mean that the low coverts companies which are established in France, but that at the end of two consecutive financial years employs at least 5,000 employees within the company's head office and its direct and indirect subsidiarities. So uh, with the head office, which is located in, Fra in France, or uh, the alternative uh, requirement for identify to identify these uh, French, these larger French companies that they have to employ at least 10,000 employees within the companies um, and it's direct and indirect subsidiarities. So all together, uh, but a head office is needs always to be located in France or abroad. So this is an, the alternative uh, requirement. According to, um, to the most recent information available, it, it was estimated that this law will apply to, uh, on average, 100, 150 large companies in France. Um, so as I said, the, uh, the goal of the law is to make these companies assess and address the impacts of their activities, both on human rights and the environment. Um, they have to publish annual public vigilance plans. What the law requires so for these vigilance plans is they have to include uh, uh, a map that identifies and analyzes and runs the risks of the activities. Uh, you know, uh, additionally, the vigilance plans has to also include procedures to uh, assess uh, uh, in accordance with the risk mapping, uh, all the situation of subsidiarities, sub subcontractors and suppliers uh, uh, have, uh, which have a commercial relationship with the company uh, on a constant basis. So it's a kind of, it's a procedure. So in, in a way, the company can follow up in this um, uh, management, in, the, in this risk management. Uh, moreover, the vigilance plans has to uh, list the appropriate act actions to mitigate the risks and prevent serious value violations. Uh, they have also to identify an alert mechanisms to collect, uh, uh, that collects potential and actual risks and a monitoring scheme monitoring scheme to follow up on the measures implemented and, as, and to assess also their efficiency. Now, uh, the interesting part, what happens if companies fail to adopt these vigilance plans? Well, uh, in case of failure, um, what the law uh, foresees is that uh, uh, actually the companies uh, can receive a formal notice to comply with the law and they have three months period to meet these obligations. So in a way they can adjust their plans. Uh, but if the company still fails to meet the obligations after the three months period, the judge can oblige the company to publish the plan. So the, public, the obligation to publication comes afterwards. Um, uh, the, last, uh, the last thing that I wanted to say is that uh, the law empowers the victims and concerned parties to bring the issue before the judge. Or what does it mean that the par interested parties can engage the company's liability through civil action? They can ask compensation uh, if the violation of the legal of the legal obligation caused damages, and the judges can apply fines up to 10,000 10, euros uh, for the failure to publish the plans. They can also go up to 30 million euros if actually uh, the damages can, could be prevented by the companies. So, and this is the additional point. Um, I think uh, this is enough just to uh, summarize a little bit the, the main points of the law. What I wanted to add is that, uh, so the law first of all needs to be put in the, in the framework of the approach in France to the environment, which is already quite advanced because uh, the French law already implemented important uh, um, uh, innovations to tackle the damage to the environment. Also, for example, uh, France and Germany are the most advanced countries in Europe when it comes to the prevention of environmental damage to the environment and biodiversity itself, when they have to build uh, in, in case of projects, plants. So in, they have already an obligation to uh, mitigate the damage to the environment, for example, 
in the, the so-called mitigation hierarchy. Uh, this is an obligation to uh, make sure that the, when, when they build the new projects, uh, which can have an impact on the environment, and of course also the human rights, which are linked to the environment, they have to uh, uh, make sure that the project uh, uh, actually minimize all the impact, all the, the impacts on the environment, uh, and they have to show that they did the, their best through their project. Uh, and this obligation is uh, quite relevant both in Germany and France. Uh, moreover, uh, when it comes to the duty of vigilance, uh, uh, this law is not the only experience uh, in, uh, in Europe because we also have important laws in Switzerland, for example. We have the, Su the uh, in the Swiss Coalition for Corporate Justice, which collected signatures for a referendum on mandatory human rights due diligence um, already. And uh, uh, actually, this is an initiative now put to the popular vote in Switzerland. Um, or moreover, we have the, I think uh, all, uh, all of us already heard about the EU non-financial reporting directive, which was already adopted at the EU level. And this is uh, applicable to 8,000 large uh, European companies which have to report on their impacts to human rights, the environment, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, social and labor and anti-corruption matters, including their due diligence processes. So this is already something which is uh, in, uh, in force since 2017. We have additional interesting experiences in the UK. In 2016, the UK adopted the transparency supply chain, chain clause of the Modern Slavery Act, uh, which uh, in this provision requires companies uh, which, are, which have their main office in the UK to report uh, on the measures they, they took, they take to prevent the slavery or human rights impacts in their supply chains. Um, there is also uh, an interesting ex uh, experiment in the, in the Netherlands. In February 2017, the Dutch parliament adopted the Child Labour Due Diligence Bill. Um, so uh, we have some experiences already in uh, which refers to uh, business and human rights, uh, according always to the UN guiding principles which uh, on business and human rights, which uh, uh, were adopted in 2011. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to say is that in the past two years, uh, several European institutions or, uh, are as I have been asking for two years already a business and human rights framework that can actually embed human rights due diligence in the law. And in March 2016, the Council of Europe recommendation called on the states to require business enterprises to conduct uh, mandatory human rights due diligence. So uh, we uh, actually, we are uh, recognizing, a, a, I would say, a progressive attention to the, the need of national parliaments to introduce these laws. Uh, I would say, even if the UN guiding principles uh, uh, are have been adopted in 2011, uh, the Council of Europe uh, uh, came into the picture all, only in 2016, but the, uh, I would say uh, we see that still the European Commission is a bit lagging behind when it comes to enforce uh, rules uh, uh, which can set out that companies must respect human rights. So apart from this uh, important directive which uh, refers only to large companies at the European level, uh, the attempts at the EU level are still a little bit slow. So that's... Cool. Excellent. Fr Francesca, thank you very much. This was a, a very complex sort of set of legal issues, which you, I think, sort of managed to package and present, present in a very succinct way. Thank you very much. Now, um, I understand that Bob's Code for Corporate Citizenship um, is to a large extent, or to be most effective, I should say, should be aimed at the international community globally. So there's, in, in a way, of course, it, it would be amazing if this was sort of like agreed at an international level or indeed, say, at a European level. So um, before we open up the discussion, <clears throat> I, I would be quite interested um, in, um, in how supranational organizations, the EU in particular, 
uh, with a few boss proposal and where um, and I'm, I think I'm addressing Susanna here in particular, where you see key adoption challenges at the European and the national or the state level, because I think there is a kind of a, an, a, a there's a sort of a, a, a dovetailing uh, of, of legal regimes that I think it's, it's you know, uh, if, if, if they don't really fit together, there can be quite, uh, quite, quite a lot of resistance. So, um, Susanna, over to you. Let's switch perspective once more from sort of the, the, the nation state or sort of the, the, the the, the multiple nation state level that, that Francesca so elegantly presented to a European or uh, supranational level and, 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 and see how Bob's uh, 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 Code for Corporate Citizenship would incorporate or in, in, uh, integrate there. Over to you, Susanna. Thank you, Nico. First of all, I want to say that I find the, the, the clause suggested by Mr. Hindi wonderful because it's very simple. It's uh, and general, so covers environmental, human rights, and social uh, uh, needs uh, at a time. While our legislative process is much more detailed and covers piece by piece, and it's much more complex. Anyway, as, uh, as an Italian and a European, I'm more because it is our seeing how legislation is made. So, uh, we have three uh, legislative levels here, the national one, the European one, for, for us Europeans, of course, and the global one. Uh, first of all, uh, the global as it is, uh, hasn't worked with, very well until now, because it's true that we have guiding UN guide, guiding prime principles, but uh, these are the typical soft law instrument, and uh, it's up to states to decide to implement it or not and uh, in general terms also the suggested clause would be up to states to implement or not so uh, we have uh, a bit less than 200 states and uh, especially for global uh, for multinational companies we have a uh, uh, legal states which can easily move from one country to another to skip legislation national legislation so i think that really the solution lays at global level but what is lacking at global level are the tools. Now, uh, the European experience is uh, uh, the only one when we have uh, binding tools over the states. And even if it's partial, as we have seen, because it covers also some pieces, and it's, all, it's also very much on the making because we have this uh, uh, big Green Deal plan. You, you know very well, hey, Nico, and uh, hey, Francesca knows very well. And uh, these goals, which are the uh, new, neutral uh, environmental impact for 2050 and uh, the, the, the reduction of the, of the impact of 55% by 2030, and the huge number of pieces of legislation going on at the moment at different stages to reach these two goals. But this is only for the environmental side. Then if we move to the social and human rights, there is another wave of, uh, of, uh, of tools and, uh, and, and laws. Maybe the most relevant is uh, the um, EU Action Plan on Human Rights and Democracy 2020-2024, because this is a comprehensive uh, action plan covering the external action of the union, both in international organizations and also in the relation with the business uh, uh, community. Um, but this is a big and other slow, just a UN <laughs> guiding. We have the same problem. So point is that uh, we should somehow step up in uh, some of the many uh, one of some of the many UN family organizations could be UNDP, could be UN ICCC or uh, environmental assembly and find a way to create there some binding piece of legislation. I know it sounds naive, or, uh, uh, but it's, it's not so much because uh, in my experience in the last five years I collected uh, quite a number of, uh, of uh, um, organizations to work with our supranational democracy, let's say coalition, and and uh, I found also some uh, corporate uh, organizations. Uh, 
which share the idea, which is very much in the, in the clause uh, of, uh, of Robert Finkley, the, the clause that companies could also work for the common good. It doesn't exclude that they make their own interest, but they also can work for common good. I, I will give you two, two examples. One is uh, the, the, the collective called the Purpose Drive and Innovation Ecosystem. This is an, an association of corporate people who share in the current uh, you, you know, global needs shift from, from the individual uh, business perspective to the common good and without losing, of course, it's right to, to make profit because they don't exclude mutually. You can make profit and be also, of course, for common good. So that, that's an association of corporate people who believe this. The network called the Business Fights Poverty. And these are also many uh, corporate people who gather every year to set the goals uh, in order to improve uh, uh, the positive impact on the, on the communities while doing their own business. So I think this kind of experiments are maybe a part of the solution because uh, it's true that we need some kind of bonding to tools bottom up, but we need also uh, top down, sorry, but we need also some kind of bottom up uh, um, awareness among business people. So uh, the multi-stakeholder approach maybe could be the solution. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if uh, uh, I can uh, provide some examples there, but there are already some multi-stakeholder platforms here and there, like internet business community or whatever. And uh, maybe we can use these places to adopt shared instruments, legal instruments, uh, binding on a voluntary basis, maybe with more success than these uh, um, declarations of principles international level, which are just uh, to, uh, in Europe, we could, for sure, we could, I think we could improve uh, actual legislation using some of the uh, some some hints from these uh, these uh, clauses suggested for from from Robert think I, I I don't think I don't see any obstacle. It very much fits into the goals that Europe has already set for itself. But at global level, I think we have to think harder and find some uh, international organization who is willing to be a platform a forum also for corporate association willing to partner to promote this kind of clause, because uh, otherwise, if we have to change one by one, 198 countries, it, it really takes time. And in the meantime, of course, companies will skip from one, one, camp, one country to the other, and this is our major problem. So uh, as we had this uh, mi minimum threshold for taxation agreed in G7 and in OECD, which after percolated in the EU legislation, I think the same should happen also for uh, for this uh, for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of approach. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, 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 Susanna. This was this was a very interesting. just one d direct question. I might that sort of been on on my mind here. Um, I, I'm not a legal expert by by any means, but uh, um, I I had the kind of international criminal court in the back of my mind where countries essentially subscribe, you know, to their legal code. And if you're a member of the international criminal court, then the law applies. If you're not, then it doesn't. Um, and, and I wonder whether such a, an arrangement might work with uh, Bob's proposal. Say if the WTO would, as, as one example, uh, you know, a, a trade organization, a global trade, would yeah. say, well, you can subscribe to that code. And if you do, then you'll be held to it. And if you don't, well, then you're not part of it. Would such an arrangement be conceivable? I think so. But it, it's really a large majority of countries willing to push for it. And so we are back to the, the initial problem because sometimes countries speculate on these, uh, you know, uh, welcoming, <laughs> easier environment for, for companies in order to attract investments. So this is the real enemy, I think, this attitude of attracting at any cost the legal seats of issues. 
So ah, another another interesting suggestion uh, suggestion which comes from the European experience is that uh, we have at the moment uh, a huge investment plan, as may, maybe you all know, which is the uh, next generation EU. And uh, it's interesting that uh, we have a number of requirements for companies to apply for funding and uh, environmental requirements. Uh, there is a taxonomy of what is acceptable, what is not on the, on the environmental side. We have also some social requirements, uh, uh, for instance, gender equality, having a plan for gender equality. So also using funding, and I'm thinking also of IMF and World Bank, for instance, as a, a, an incentive to promote uh, the, the introduction of such a clause could be another way. Excellent. Well, Susanna, thank you very much for that overview. Let me now switch perspective once more. And I know uh, Young Yin has raised a hand, but the floor is yours anyway. So I didn't, <laughs> I didn't bring you in any earlier. <laughs> Young Yin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you, you are obviously coming to this from a kind of, if you like, a, a business and investment perspective. Um, and you have got many years of impact investing experience. And I think you probably have sort of a gut feeling of how changes in law in that direction might impact your industry. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested when you reflect on this, where you see potential resistance and also, of course, where you see potential support coming from mm. the investment community. Uh, Yang Yen, over mm. to you. Okay, great. Thanks. Then I'll make sure to uh, address maybe the, the idea that I had or the point uh, in, towards the end. Uh, so maybe just to, to begin with uh, a very short um, uh, a primer on, on impact investing. Not everyone might be familiar with, with it, although it's uh, becoming quite uh, popular as an investment practice. And uh, I think the, the key mm, defining criterion is, is probably that it is an investment practice that aspires to take real world impacts, positive and negative ones, uh, more fully into account uh, compared to, for example, uh, ESG investing, uh, meaning that um, impact investors uh, try to um, achieve a positive, net positive real world impact at, a, uh, at an asset level, either through, for example, transformation of an asset that is generating negative impact, you know, into, into one that generates a net positive impact, or at least uh, becomes less harmful, you know, neutral, impact neutral, uh, or uh, that already generates a positive impact by virtue of its products and services, you know, taking the negative impacts of that might be uh, caused by operations into account, for example. So, so impact investors try to look at the whole picture, the balance, you know, and see where maybe positive impacts, negative impacts, how they how they um, uh, are need to be compared, you know, as part of an ethical judgment. And then they, in addition, uh, impact investors try to uh, positively uh, influence the impact generated by the by the asset, or positively, you know, make a make a contribution. To the to the asset's uh, impact performance, so that they can that there is an addition to the asset impact and uh, an investor impact that you can speak of. You know something that has improved the asset uh, without the which, which wouldn't have been observable without the investors' activities, right? Either providing capital or non financial support. And then uh, two more things. Uh, one is uh, uh, impact intentionality. So impact investors uh, operate as a dual mandate. So they already make clear from the beginning through impact strategy and impact governance, for example. So we can see this from outside. It's all documented, you know, that uh, it's not just about financial performance, but also about impact performance, uh, dual mandate. And uh, they, and in practice, you can also see this by um, uh, impact measurement and management activities. You know, there's a system in place that operates and during the holding period tries to uh, continuously improve uh, impact. So this is something that that I think I would say uh, um, uh, characterizes uh, impact investing uh, as, a, as a practice. And you can also see that there's already uh, the, the concept of double materiality uh, takes, you know, plays an important role for impact investors. You know, so it's not only about what affects the valuation of the of the company or its economic performance, but also uh, what uh, positive and negative impacts uh, the uh, asset generates out, you know, from an inside out perspective on society and the environment. Um, so, so with that said, uh, I would say impact investing is is desirable and certainly an improvement to the to the current practice that is maybe more narrowly focused only on you know what is financially material. 
Uh, but it also has systemic constraints because um, it can only be as impactful. So the financial system can only be as impactful as the economic system allows. You know, the economic system um, is also characterized by, by market pricing signals uh, and by the legal framework. You know? So um, uh, if the market is failing, meaning that uh, positive impacts are not sufficiently rewarded, uh, although as a society we would want that, right? And negative impacts are not being sanctioned or they are not being paid for by the uh, companies that are responsible for those negative impacts. So it's another form of market failure. You know, these, these negative impacts and costs are, are socialized instead. Society has to bear them. So in these cases, um, it's very difficult voluntarily to work against this market failure. Uh, there are some exceptions where maybe, you know, we can have both, you can have a free lunch and impact and a better performance uh, as a company or as an investor. But voluntary ethical behavior is often not feasible in this in a competitive uh, context. And most importantly, it's very limited to those who decide voluntarily to behave ethically, you know, and uh, uh, so the, the problem is often that uh, important uh, ethical issues, so it's things that are ethically material, uh, are not financially material, right? And normally, um, you could rely on uh, society being responsive, right? So as, a, as if, if negative impacts that are not financially material are being discovered in a well-functioning political system, there's some regulation or legislation that would shortly, you know, address, uh, change uh, company behavior. It would set incentives or sanctions and so on and make sure that companies uh, do not uh, do severe harm anymore, right? So either for legal reasons, because it's it's banned or, you know, it's not profitable anymore, right? Uh, but as long as, you know, activities are legal and profitable and the this is also why greenhouse gas production is such a huge market failure because it's both, right? Um, it's very difficult to do voluntarily something against it. So, can, you, from can, you, can yeah. I just uh, interject here one one question? Mm -hmm. My understanding is, and this is again, I'm, this is a layman's perspective on impact investing. But my my understanding is is that one of one of the one of the challenges as an impact in investor or you as an advisor of impact investors face is that impact investing is inherently not really competitive to other forms of investing in the sense that companies to this day can externalize some of their costs, which have immense impact on the environment, but they don't have to account for that um, in, 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 in their business. So uh, if, if I'm causing severe damage to the environment, but I don't have to clean it up, then that's mm. a cost that I can write off. That doesn't actually concern me. Whereas if, as an impact investor, I can't do that. Now, my, my, my question is, is, is if these kinds of laws were to come into effect, be it the French law of vigilance or be it indeed mm, uh, books, mm. uh, much more elegant, I should say, uh, Code for Corporate Citizenship, they would minimize, if not eradicate, a sort of externalities of these kinds, which would make impact investing mm. overnight far more competitive. Is that a fair point to make? Mm, yeah, so it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, complex picture or you can differentiate there are situations where it's uh, not such a huge disadvantage it can be a competitive advantage even you know to to be impactful and to you know it's very depending on a dynamic regulatory environment where it may pay off to be early an early adopter you know or voluntarily you know already gaining a competitive edge uh, for for another situation later on but um indeed uh, usually or in many cases it's it's not you know, uh, taking extra measures, uh, being extra vigilant, uh, or, you know, mitigating damages and compensating damages as a costly activity, right? So those companies who take the extra effort uh, uh, usually are not rewarded accordingly. You know, there's some maybe greater willingness to pay for within some customer groups, you know, but uh, the, the systemic at the, system, at the systems level, you know, the behavior of most other actors is not much affected. So um, this is also why one of the uh, points that I wanted to raise when I, when I raised my hand was uh, when I think about um, the uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism, for example, which is uh, an interesting example for how you can you know, maybe address um, competitive uh, disadvantage in, a, in an international context. You know, when uh, uh, carbon pricing uh, is typical to companies in Europe, for example, and they, you know, want to export or 
um, companies outside of this carbon pricing regime want to import into Europe, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is supposed to, you know, uh, adjust for these uh, competitive disadvantages and provide an incentive for companies, for countries, for other countries to, you know, adopt carbon pricing uh, at a similar level, right? So, so I think these are ways how you can can overcome this. But um, uh, so the important point that I wanted to make is that. Uh, on, a, on a voluntary basis, there's little that we can ex uh, expect, you know, from an investor's perspective, it's it's maybe probably only when you manage your own money, you know, when it's your own wealth that you deploy and you can, you have the liberty, of course, to, uh, you know, make these extra efforts and, uh, uh, you know, make some concessions on the financial performance. Uh, but when you are an institutional investor or a fiduciary who manages other you know, people's money, it's, uh, you're obligated to, you know, not make voluntary decisions that uh, lead, you know, uh, to uh, concessions on financial performance, unless they are part of the mandate, which is not really the case uh, currently, right? So I, I think you need this, you need this legal obligation that affects all companies and levels the playing field. I, I think there's an important, and I think that's a distinction that you would, would, would naturally make as well, an important decision to be between a sort of, if you like, a period of transition from the current set of affairs to a sustainable regenerative economy. And then there is the kind of the, I wouldn't want to call it an end state because it'll always be a dynamic, uh, uh, you know, picture, but, you know, beyond the transition where we have achieved a regenerative, sustainable way of doing business. And the, the, the transition is quite in so many ways different from what comes after. And I think in some ways, impact investing is all about that transition. Isn't that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Because you can in a way help mm -hmm. investment to, mm -hmm. to yeah. catalyze and to, to, uh, uh, to, to mm -hmm. you know, increase the speed at which that transition can happen. Yeah. Important, though, I agree, but it's important that investors also advocate, you know, for the policies, uh, the legal changes, the pricing adjustments and so on, right, that uh, uh, promote this uh, transition at the systems level. So, uh, but then, yes, uh, <laughs> I would agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, and I think Bob made that point earlier as well, that once his code would be implemented, say, for instance, that the transition to a low carbon economy could be achieved I believe Bob thinks so much mm. quicker because it would give clear guidance and impetus to business to get there in their own yeah. way, but as quickly so, as they can. Just a very brief uh, input also from what I see from the business community. I think it's important to make sure that uh, the, the concept of severe harm is well defined. Uh, or on the other hand, that uh, I see there are other proposals, for example, that aim at stakeholder capitalism, where they say, you know, companies should respect all interests of all stakeholders. Uh, and this is going beyond severe harm, right, but has been criticized uh, for being too, you know, uh, uh, ambiguous and uh, and difficult to implement in practice. Uh, when you think about board meetings where interests of all stakeholders are continuously being discussed and there's little, you know, li less guidance or it's not as clear as when you talk about severe harm, but even the concept of severe harm, you know, needs to be defined, but it's more intuitive and it's uh, um, more practical. Uh, yeah, actually, absolutely. Francesca, uh, um, when 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 we had uh, uh, contact over email, you mentioned that you wanted to say a little bit more about this concept of severe harm. Can I bring you back in at this point very briefly for you to add those points? Yeah, actually, this is a point that I wanted to link with the Environmental Liability Directive, because there we actually talk about the prevention and remediation of significant damage. So we are talking about this kind of damage to the environment, which actually created a lot of problems because this regards how we can really identify the threshold of significance. Uh, and actually the directive is linking this to the state of normal functioning of, uh, I would say, healthy functioning of the ecosystem. And uh, there, the directive is only uh, related to uh, natural resources with biodiversity value. Uh, so we talk about protected species, protected habitats. Uh, and it's quite interesting that they, uh, in a way, they didn't really address a damage, a normal damage to the environment, but only uh, the damage which can be significant and that can actually um, undermine or really impede protected species and uh, habitats to function in a healthy way. 
but there, uh, although this sounds something reasonable, uh, when we talk with the ecologists, they are quite uh, uh, the, the point or the identification of the threshold is quite controversial because sometimes they adopt quantitative measures. For example, is this uh, a number of protected species that can um, make us think uh, that the ecosystem is working, is functioning in a good way, or it's a, 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 the state of the environment is really healthy or not. Um, so there are controversies about the measurement of these significance, whether it should be a quantitative uh, measurement or qualitative. Um, and um, if the measurement is only quantitative, it becomes really, uh, it can become very, um, I would say, risky or because it doesn't take into account everything. So, and I, I there, there much has been written on that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Bob, uh, you've been raising your hand. You have things to say on that. Over to you. Yes, I, I, I want to clarify something about the definition of severe harm. And I want to use the environment as the example. Does anybody think that the emission of significant quantities of greenhouse gases th at this point it does not cause severe harm to the environment. That is the number one issue that I am after. And that would be the first thing off the, uh, off the cab rank. Um, the, the idea behind the code is to only stop se severe harm. Now, what does severe mean? Well, I always tell people, because I'm an American lawyer, the Supreme Court once said, in response to what is pornography, the answer was, I know it when I see it, okay? And if you define severe harm loosely, recognizing that it should have a very high threshold, like for instance, causing global warming and climate change, then all of a sudden this becomes a much simpler problem, okay? The object behind the code, at least initially, is not to take on biodiversity. It's not to take on any particular issue right now, except one that is causing an existential problem for our planet. That is severe harm. And if you do that, then all of a sudden, the code is targeted not against a wide variety of companies all over the world. It's targeted against very specific companies companies that emit significant quantities of greenhouse gases. And I will start with electric power generators and include as well motor vehicle manufacturers. Now, these are two industries that contribute tremendously to global warming. And if they were stopped relatively quickly, then we would make tremendous progress in terms of corporate behavior. And there is every reason to believe it can be stopped relatively quickly. The technology for motor vehicle uh, is there. The technology for electricity generation is there. All you have to do is come to Australia and see it. But um, the wind and solar, which used to be the expensive way to generate electricity, here has become the cheap way to generate electricity. And what I'm doing with regard to these companies for Young Jin is I'm creating opportunity for impact investment to fund that transition because every investment dollar that goes into that transition would be an impact investment. Excellent, thank you. Now, uh, uh, Susanna, I have a question for you here. Um, and and uh, it, this is a kind of in part of a toy quest, but it's, it's sort of, it's the elephant in the room for me to some extent. Um, would Bob's code for corporate citizenship ultimately be able to replace the kind of legal arrangements or the kind of the laws like the French uh, uh, law uh, of uh, sort of uh, vigilance? Would this be a replacement or would this sit alongside? And how do you see the relationship between this really rather kind of simple but not simplistic code that uh, Bob proposes and the far more codified and more complex uh, uh, sort of legal arrangement that we have in place at the moment. How do you see the relationship between those two, Susanna? Maybe Bob wants to say something before that. 
<laughs> I'll take you off the hook, Susanna, if you'll let me. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Bob. The code only addresses severe behavior that causes severe damage. There is plenty of room for business regulation to handle damage that doesn't rise to the severe level. And that will always be necessary and it should be enacted on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. The code also has to be enacted jurisdiction by jurisdiction um, as uh, was pointed out. Um, but what we have to keep in mind is the law is the same essentially in every jurisdiction. In every jurisdiction, directors are supposed to act only in the best interest of the company. So it may be 198 countries. And I have to tell you, I come from a country where you have to do it in 50 states. Um, but the law is the same everywhere. And you know what? People understand that there's something wrong with the way the law works. Because why should corporations have no duty to protect the public interest from severe harm. That makes no sense. It's, the code really should be non-controversial and it is something that can be adopted jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but relatively easily, you can get an universal solution. Excellent. Susanna, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. I totally agree, <laughs> and especially outside Europe because we have plenty of these laws and maybe the, the difficult is just in the in the knowledge of citizens on how to make them work for them because I think that there is a gap of knowledge also. But uh, uh, of course, this uh, this co this co would be responsible to company, and so we transform all citizens and mostly civil society organizations in watchdogs because they have a tool, a legal tool which is something, of course. I'm thinking of the uh, climate litigation we have seen in Europe, for instance, against some states. So states who uh, signed the Paris Convention, uh, Netherlands, for instance, were convened by civil society for not respecting the cap on emissions that were similar uh, of legal obligation generalized on companies I'm sure we would see much of this litigation companies. So, uh, and maybe an effort of companies to prevent such litigation, which is the, the, the sensible thing to do, of course. So I think this could work. Uh, of course, I think it needs uh, some laws. We need to pass some laws to, to, uh, to uh, oblige companies to um, endorse this commitment in the in the duties of directors. At least uh, my, my, my legal thinking is that, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there is a way to do this voluntarily, but I'm sure that 90% of these specific uh, uh, area of companies wouldn't do that. Maybe in other areas where the emissions are already very low, they would do this because it's very, very good for communication exactly. and uh, it's more effective than greenwashing. <laughs> but in the really significant, and I would add one, one category to the two you already mentioned, Bob, which is uh, the intensive co-breeding, uh, the production of meat. So that's also very, uh, uh, very interesting on the, on the environment. So I, I think this could work because it would empower citizens to, to control in some way. Okay, let me just kind of come with a follow-up question. It's kind of aimed both at uh, Yang Yin and at Bob. Um, at the moment, we assume when we think company, we think of producers, people making cars, people, whatever, making goods. But what about service businesses? For example, if a bank or an investment company invests in a company that causes severe harm, would that company be held to the same standards and principles as the manufacturing company that has the harm? Uh, Bob, you first. Maybe, Yang Yin, you have some sure. ideas on that too. If you were to pass the Code for Corporate Citizenship with respect to the environment, 
and basically at the same time passed companion legislation in every jurisdiction that, that forced a transition period and a much more red, rapid transition period than what we've been talking about. No bank will invest in a fossil fuel generating burning manufacturing company thereafter because it will be a short-lived asset. They'll be interested in, in, in financing Yongjin's uh, projects to build wind and solar and distribution for these um, uh, 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 generating stations. They'll be interested in financing electric vehicles and other forms of uh, transportation that don't use uh, fossil fuels, but they will, they'll stop investing in the other things. Well, but I can't, finance I, will take care of itself because but, finance I, 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 wants I, a return. I, I, I'm not sure about that. I can think about many ways in which companies can invest in very short term and also pull money very quickly, be it credit lines, be it short term loans, all kinds of ways of making money very quickly. And would these come, I mean, you know, you're sort of saying they wouldn't, but my question is what would the law say if they do, if they find a way? Maybe Yang Yin, you have some ideas on this. Uh, well, well, I, I mean, I have to agree with Bob that I think the biggest effect is perhaps that the, uh, you know, assets become less attractive, uh, you know, capital costs uh, become higher, litigation risk increases, you know, so I see it also as an indirect way to, uh, you know, uh, integrate externalities and the cost, social costs into, you know, company operations, uh, or complementary at least to, you know, to pricing, subsidies, taxes, and so on, uh, very important complementary, though. but um uh, I you don't I think investors uh, depending also on on perhaps how directly they provide uh, capital to enable activities that otherwise wouldn't uh, be possible. But in any case, they just enable companies uh, to you know to for, uh, um, to conduct activities, uh, and so this uh, they are somewhat remote. You know, I'm not sure if they. Um, other than economic considerations and risk consideration, but there's also a reputational risk uh, to consider, right? But uh, they not sure if they could be held liable legally for something that the company is doing. I know, have a specific the, uh, case in mind. You know, the opioid, uh, opioid uh, crisis or a pandemic in the US and McKinsey's mm -hmm. involvement as an advisor to the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industries. This is an mm -hmm. example where, you know, are they can they be sued you know because they are part of causing the harm um mm. and, and so this is this is the question and uh, because of course they have been making money mm. all the way along um and um, and if you know a pharmaceutical would go mm. bankrupt as a result of it because they would be held accountable mm. for the law the mckinsey's of this world would still walk away with all the consulting income they've already pocketed <laughs> but but oh. that's not under the code Nico, <laughs> but would, would that's, McKinsey's uh, or other service that's, companies that's also under, be covered under That's under, under the code? older that's law. Uh, would um, would companies like service companies and banks and investors also be covered under the code? In your view, that's the question. Um, well, I don't think banks lending money is creating the problem. I think the company burning fossil fuels is the problem, and if you're putting a stop to them burning fossil fuels. Then the bank isn't going to problem me to create a problem either. I think it's in. I think it's a mistake, and I think we've made this mistake for a long time now to think finance is going to drive yeah, businesses right. to yeah, do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the what, key it's to what a sustainable financial system is a sustainable economy, critically. You know. Maybe, 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 maybe finance was a wrong yeah. example. I'm really thinking service businesses, including yeah. finance investment. Yeah. But I'm thinking yeah. specifically the likes of McKinsey's who have had a massive yeah. influence and impact yeah. on the whole opioid crisis in, in the US. And I yeah. believe there have been lawsuits. I don't know how successful they've yeah. been. Yeah, that's, but it's up to you know the, the, the juries to decide. You know, litigation, liability. Uh, these are you know ethical, uh, you know legal. Sure, Questions but the question is, would the code also apply to those service businesses or would it only apply to those who produce the products? The first question, Nico, is would the code, which prevents companies or directors from allowing their company to continue to cause severe harm to the public health and safety, had applied to the opioid manufacturers? And I think the answer was, would be is if the code was in place, 
I think directors of that company and other companies in the same business that were doing the same thing would have thought twice before they started pushing their product the way they did, because it would clearly cause severe damage to the whole public health and safety. And so the business model would have changed in response to the code, which is exactly the way the code is supposed to work. It's going to, the idea is to put a threat out there on directors that if they cause severe harm to the public interest, it can cost them in forms of forcing them to stop and incurring the expenses of stopping and possibly the research and development costs the risky research and development costs, which will cost them, which will allow them to stay in business some other way. I understand that dynamic. That's the whole system sensitive management. I totally get that. My question mm -hmm. is kind of more fundamental. Is this code sort of, do you think of this as a universal law that applies to all businesses? Or do you see this as a kind of a sectoral that only applies to manufacturing or to certain businesses? That's the question. Good. Absolutely. That is a fantastic question. And it goes to a couple of things, one of which is the ability to marshal the political will to pass it. The truth of the matter is that it applies to a small minority of companies who are now causing severe harm. It's only a tiny minority, less than a hundredth or a thousandth of 1% of all companies out there. However, the code is phrased to apply to all companies. And the reason for that is, is that we want all companies to right. realize that they should never get in the position of causing severe damage to the public interest. And what is severe damage to the public interest? It's whatever the public eventually determines it to be down the road. And that can, that can be a threshold that's way out here, or it can start to move in. As we find out things about technology, about new, uh, new inventions, about new harms that arise. You know, a hundred years ago, probably tobacco wasn't, wasn't, wouldn't have been on the list of causing severe harm. But along in about 1970, we found out what it does, and it, and it kills millions of people every year. Is that a severe harm that should uh, be prohibited? You bet it is. And, and when, if tobacco companies had learned about, had had the code to deal with 40 years ago, they would have taken different steps with regards to the development of their product and mass distribution. Um, and so that's that's how the code is supposed to work. Not so much by getting uh, people into courthouses and determining it pursuant to lawsuits, but to work on the mindset of directors to keep them always looking out to make sure their company doesn't cause severe harm. And right now, most companies can live with that. Uh, the vast, well over 99% of companies can can live with that. I totally get that, Bob. So it's, is it fair to say that the code you propose, you know, is, would be a universal law that applies to all companies everywhere, but it will only affect a very small number of companies, namely those who, in the eyes of our societies, cause severe harm. Is that a fair way of putting it? That is a perfect way of putting it. Thank you very much. Bob, thank you very much. Now, I would like to give everybody uh, here today a last word. And essentially what I'd like to know is, is, you know, where do you place Bob's proposal sort of on the kind of on the greater scheme of things? Is this something that uh, should be pursued? And if so, at which level? Um, who should take this up? And what, you, what is your take on, on how this could move forward? Um, maybe we start again with Bob. <laughs> I, I would say, well, clearly I've been at it for 20 years, so I would say it definitely should be pursued, but I'll say more than that. Um, I think that there's a lot of evidence out there that there is vast support for the concept that corporations should not be allowed to cause severe harm to the five elements of the public interest I'm talking about, and that there are numerous tens of thousands of NGOs out there all over the world fighting a problem that has a common cause. And the common cause is the duty of directors actually prevents companies from stopping when it's too expensive to stop causing the damage. 
And if those NGOs united just for 10% of their time in an effort to get the code passed, um, I think we would it, would, it, it wouldn't take that long. Now, there are opportunities like maybe the cops, the UN, other places to make, uh, to make the idea more generally known. Um, uh, but I think the political will has to come from the people. I think it's there. We just got to draw it out. Thank you very much, Bob. Francesca, what's your uh, kind of like on reflection you take on this? Okay, I have a very, okay, my personal uh, opinion is that the damage to the, the situation that we are actually experiencing now requires a lot of tools altogether. And I am personally very much in favor of a code that actually refers to severe damage to the environment in addition to other tools which are also in place to prevent and minimize the damage to the environment. But I guess, but my point is that it's crucial to empower citizens in this regard, because um, I, I also, well, well, because, yeah, just to one point, but citizens can also have conflicting interest when it comes to the protection of the environment and human rights. So it's crucial to also think about how the role of the citizens can be adjust, adjusted to this, um, uh, to counterbalance the power of companies in a way that citizens only uh, do, only act on behalf of the environment. Um, and I, but I, I don't agree with the fact that we should not uh, bring into the picture also the banks and those who are uh, giving money to companies because we also need to use additional tools in this regard. I guess the crisis is too serious to limit ourselves just to one side of the, of the problem. This is my. Uh, if, if I you. could say one thing about the banks, Nico. Um, I let I you, I'll let you have the last word, Bob. I let you have the okay. very last word. Uh, Susanna, okay. over I, to I you. just didn't want anybody to think that I was letting the banks off free, but that's okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't think you will. I don't think you would. I'll let you have the last word. Susanna, over to you. I think, uh, I think we all agree that we are in an, an unprecedented uh, 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 global crisis, environmental global crisis, which is... Uh, very close to a non return point. So it's an emergency. And I think we, we, we need to use all the tools possible. And this close is one of the tools and very much would appreciate the level to the global organizations. So if there is something we could do together, let me know. And I also would like to say that this goes in the direction of having some kind of ethical business, which is very important in the general scheme of shifting the paradigm towards uh, you know, the survival of humanity and uh, uh, there are very other thing, other interesting experiments going on uh, on other sides of this, uh, this ethical, ethical approach. And for instance, the Athens Charter for Ethical Business, which has been uh, drafted by the Athens. Uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, charter, for instance, is all about shifting the, the perspective to the short-termism, which we actually see in business, so making profits every quarter, which is very, very uh, short-sighted to the long, medium and long term is so for instance, uh, abolishing the quarter reports, but, but just to say that we, we need the, to rethink business. And so I'm absolutely in favor of this close. And I think it makes very much sense in the more general uh, reframing that we are trying to, to make of economics, uh, which works for individuals and not just for a few individuals. So I mm -hmm. agree also with what Francesca said about citizens. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Susanna. Um, Yang Yen. 
Yeah, I, uh, I see the code as a redefinition of the core of the purpose of the corporation. But in a way that one wonders why it hasn't been, you know, that way all along, right? Uh, it's just surprising sometimes that, uh, you know, this is not self-evident uh, and codified. Uh, and I see it also as complementary to adjusting uh, market price signals, intensive structures, and also public investments for the public good. There, there's a broader range of tool sets that we need to deploy right now all at once, you know, at, as much as we can. Thank you very much. I have heard Bob say before that really he sees his code as a way of giving corporations a conscience. Um, it's not just um, a set of rules, but it's a reminder that they have a responsibility. Bob, you have the last word. Do you want to elaborate on this? Well, I, 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 I like that way of phrasing it, Nico, because um well as we all know corporations they don't have a conscience they're they're a piece of they're 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 pieces of paper and their relationships of how people work together and often people work together in ways that results in behavior they themselves personally would never uh condone because they have a conscience um i did want to say um one thing about what yun jun said is why hasn't it happened sooner well, the truth is, back up until about 1880, protecting the public interest was part of the corporate law. And back then in the United States, we, under, we went through something that was called the race to the bottom. And protecting the public interest was taken out of the corporate law. And it worked okay for a while because back then the technology was relatively primitive. Companies were relatively small. There were no companies that were causing severe harm to the public interest. But as time went by and companies got bigger and the technology got more dis destructive, created more externalities, that's what's causing the need to bring the code in. And finally, for Francesca, I, I, I did not mean to give the impression that the code is the only solution. The code changes the mindset, not just of directors, but of the public at large, and specifically our legislators. After the, the and, and to the extent I criticized letting the banks try to make this happen, it was because they were never going to be able to lead and make this change. But if you pass the code, there is plenty of, all of a sudden, legislators have this fundamental point that everybody's changed their mind on. And that is corporations should no longer be allowed to cause severe harm to the environment and these four other elements of the public interest. Now, legislators job is to recognize that harm to the public interest is a bad thing and do what they can to reduce it every step of the way, including regulating finance that finances harm, not severe harm, because severe harm should be off the table, but any harm that causes uh, that are that companies are causing is fair game for legislatures to regulate the finance of. So I um, and I, I think it was Susanna mentioned other tools. I it's not just finance. There's there's other ways to regulate uh, corporate behavior. We we we're trying to do it today. The code should give all that legislation a leg up because finally a principle has been set that. It's not the purpose of corporations to cause harm to the public interest and what can be done to reduce it should be done. Excellent, I think this is a very okay. good point. Sorry, did somebody else want to add to this? I, I think this is a very good point uh, uh, to stop. Well, um, Bob, thank you very much for being at the center of the storm as it were today and uh, <laughs> making yourself available for this round table it's been a great privilege to have you um this was robert hingley francesca luigi susanna cafaro and yang yin koi thank you very very much for being here today um as always this round table will go up online and um obviously you're more than welcome to share it with uh your networks and friends thank you all ever so much for being here with me today thank you Thank you all for participating. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.